campus. And although I couldn't do an exact accounting, I'm just going to say that more than 100 riders have gone through our ranks. It might be 200, but because I can't say that for sure, I'm just going to say more than 100 in those 20 years. Because people come in, you know, stay for a couple years or stay a long time, as some of us. But, um, and then people go on to graduate school, people move, people um, publish, all kinds of things. But it's really a wonderful group. And as a facilitator, I just wanted to say I'm so uh, uh, pleased, proud, and just happy to be part of the group because it's very convivial, collegial. Um, we share a lot of great ideas about writing and how to reach an audience and how to make things better. But we also have a lot of fun in our meetings. And um, we take in new people. I get emails every week, like two or three people asking if they can join. And people come and try it for a little bit. And then we have our mainstay group, uh, many of whom you're going to hear tonight. Um, tonight, we have a lot of novelists out there. And I think it's amazing. I think we've got about six or seven of our um, membership are actually you know, knee deep in a novel, let's just say. So that's really exciting for us. And uh, we'll just move forward. And we'll start with uh, Susan Staggs. We're going to go through the program. And then we welcome you to join us afterwards for uh, refreshments. Thank you. This is such a beautiful space, <laughs> the new room. Yeah. So I'm going to be reading the first part of a short story, <clears throat> which is called Nuda. <clears throat> it is the year 2008. The stock market has crashed. Not in Mexico, in the United States, but we Mexicans feel the event deeply as we do everything that happens across the border. If it's happened to them, it's happened to us. We take it personally. As the saying goes, poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States. It is the year 2008, and gravestones in the Jewish cemetery of our beautiful Aztec capital have been pulled out of the earth like rotten teeth. They lie on their sides, smeared with swastikas and the best of Nazi slogans, Jews out, Mexico for Mexicans, death to the kikes. Russian Nuda, who is 89 years old, sees this as an ominous sign. She sits in her living room in Mexico City with her daughter-in-law, Kali. She dreams of her dead husband, German Juan. They are refugees, these three, leaving Russia, Germany, and Spain in the 1900s. We open the doors and the torrential downpours of our beautiful city, refugee capital of the world, to anyone who comes knocking. What about Nuda? As an old woman, she's certain of two things, that the Russian Revolution her family fled, fled changed the world more profoundly than anything in history, and that sooner or later, the Nazis who killed her sister at Auschwitz will come after her. The first is her optimism, the second her pessimism, and they live inside of her like ends of a seesaw. It's hard for her to balance. But it's, October, it, but it's an October day of 2008. Nura and Kali sit in the living room. Nura's son, Victor, and her doctor are in the dining room of her home eating her borscht. She makes a mess in the kitchen. The blood of the meat, the red of the beets, blood all over the potatoes, onion, and cabbage that not even the vinegar can cauterize. But when it gets to the table in front of them, it's hot and it's good. Victor and Dr. Feather sit at an old dining, cedar dining table, a threadbare rug under their feet, bare walls. German Juan was a painter, and his work graces the walls of the rest of their small apartment. But the dining room walls are empty. All there is to do in this room is lower your head to your soup and eat, and don't slurp your soup like a Russian. In between mouthfuls, Feather says, can you believe she thinks Nazis are coming back in this day and age? Like all Mexican doctors, Feather is well versed in American medical practices and its slang. He's prescribed treatments for Nuda, including and especially biologics, which she refuses to take. What I'm asking her to do, he says to Victor, and in English, is to live in the moment. But it's Nuda's Swiss cheese memory as well as her paranoia that have got her into trouble in the first place. It's been decided she, she'll go to an old age home. They have a week to break the news to her. There were signs of Nuda's paranoia when she was a young woman, Feather reminds Victor, but that pale yellow paranoic broth has cooked itself up over the years into a full-blooded full borscht. It's boiled over, he says, removing his napkin from his neck and placing it firmly on the table, and we can't have that. 
Gali does not know how to tell Nuda that next Sunday they'll come for her. If only she had not talked so much about Zyklon B coming in through the windows or let her voice tremble <coughs> and her eyes fill with tears. It was too much for them. Nuda did not start out smelling the Zyklon B gas the Nazis used to kill her sister at Auschwitz. If that's how she died, no one knows for sure. She honed her skills for years on lesser chemicals, turpentine, household cleaners, fingernail polish, furniture polish, cat urine from the neighbor's apartment, which German Juan insisted could not possibly penetrate the wall into their home. German Juan's paints were banned, of course. He had to rent a little space in the garage of their apartment building as his studio. She railed at him for doubting her abilities. Women could smell better than men, and young women, especially on their periods, were little bitches. Bend down and smell this, she would ask any young woman she could coax into their apartment if she was confused about a smell. At the apogee of her skills, when she could detect the tiniest amount of Zyklon B, she was startled to discover that none of the young women could smell it. German Juan could not convince Nuda that it's normal for ovens to give off a little gas. No, she said, it doesn't smell like that. It smells like burnt almonds. It goes up the nose and breaches the butterfly bone at the gate of the braid, hissing. <clears throat> Don't you smell it? And it has a nutty aroma. It, it is a gas that deceives. You'd think it would smell acrid like lemons, like it wants to go straight into the blood and poison, but it doesn't. It's got a round edge to it, trying to please you just enough to make its way inside. He begged her to believe that the Zyklon B came to her in such tiny parts per million it could not possibly hurt her. She swallowed this at times, but then the gas began to waft into a window left open or sweep up the stairs of the building into their front door. Gali had many subterfuges to distract her from the smell of Zyklon B. Remember, old woman, when you covered the wall in German Juan's bedroom with X's, you said, you've stolen my life, you bastard. Here's an X for every day I sacrifice to you. Nyuta had no memory of such a thing, but as Gali began to tell it, she caught hold of a detail and began to paint around its edges. Her canvas was richer than Gali's. German Juan was her man, after all. When he was 65 years old, German Juan's life changed forever when a car jumped the curb and tore into his face and head, leaving no trace of a single olfactory nerve. He asked Feather if he could no longer be able to smell Nuna's borscht, the sour cream swimming in the sweet soup, or let his tongue relax in the eddies of chocolate pudding she brought to his table. It could not be, but so it was in the universe of the second that the car swerved into him and the old bones in his now beautifully reconstructed face crushed inward. There was to be no smell ever and no taste of food since the taste is in the odor, no tingling anticipation of molecules wafting up his nose. These little packages of joy turned away from his face, disappointed, why bother with German Juan? The greatest shock to him was the realization that there is a smell to every day, to a room, to a house, the world. He'd always thought only of the particular objects from which smells emanate, an orange, fresh paint, dog shit. He had never considered the canvas, the sudden absence was disorienting in a way he found hard to describe to people. He felt that he was forced to turn in on himself, but there wasn't anything for him to turn in on because he could no longer smell himself. He couldn't smell his nose, couldn't pinch it partly closed with his fingers and smell it, its unique mustiness, its private passage to his brain. It isn't like having a cold, Juan tells Nura. It's a complete void, so absent. It is curling towards its opposite and may go so far as to find itself an anti-odor which may itself have an odor. Feather said there's no such thing. They debate the philosophy of the nose. German Juan holds that sensation is the crudest form of knowledge. If I cannot smell pussy, he says, I can know nothing. <laughs> In his agony, he looks to dogs. He follows at a respectful distance a miniature schnauzer who lives in his neighborhood. The dog's owner allows his dog to stop whenever he wants to and sniff at whatever he wants. He does want. He wants to get down on his hands and knees and follow behind them, sniffing where the dog is sniffed. Would that Nura would leash him and take him for a walk, but allow him all of his pleasures. The one food that was able to pierce the barrier of the zero of his olfactory nerve was the chile. Why the chile could penetrate, Feather did not know. Perhaps there is one piece of one nerve still tingling in the wind responsive to the assault. If there is one piece left, then there is the possibility the rest can grow back, isn't there? German Juan asks. No, says Feather, no possibility. It is never a good idea to leave a man without hope. German Juan packs a bag to go where he's always gone when he can't believe the turns life takes. Guanajuato, where he will find solace in the museum of the mummified children. 
The museum is next to an outdoor market. He walks quickly when a memory of the smell of vegetables clinging to dirt stabs at him. He can feel the mummy children before he sees them. They're like white paper mache sausages with brown holes for eyes. They hang in their mother's shawls or cringe onto them with their skinny legs cranking around their mother's waist like crabs. He stares at one of them until the child's eyes spoon open like moons. As always, some try to tell their story to museum visitors but are met with stony silence. German Juan listens. The children are astounded at their own deaths. They disbelieve it with the small, shocked holes of their mouths. Before the accident, there was no torture that Nyura considered too terrible for German Juan. When he comes back from Guanajuato, she relents and approaches him with occasional kindness. But German Juan is so used to hardness from her that any time of softness comes off as a heartless affectation. So I'm Llewellyn Fletcher, and I'm going to read a few poems. Kindness. Kindness is such a small thing, says my friend. So small you'd never miss it, except its absence is like watermelon without seeds. As if in the midst of God there were an invisible bell ringing always so sweetly we feel it in sun warming our faces or cold air forming halos for anyone to claim. When someone is kind to me, it affords me kindness for others, like a coin passed from hand to hand. If it were such a small thing, it would be simpler. If it were so small, would we recognize it as a long lost friend, call out its name? This is Hot Tub Dialogues for Wendy. And the group helped me uh, work on this this week. And it's really prompted because I find that people talk to me in the hot tub. <laughs> so uh, anyway, and then there's lots of conversation in the hot tub if you've ever um, experienced this. It has an epigraph uh, from Rilke. My blood is alive with many voices that tell me I am made of longing. Blasting bubbles, tender as baby mice. The near intimacy, it's nice. A man will talk, listen, rudy fingers wagging. Golf game, master class, smarter than the rest. Beyond size 48 with air fills my swimsuit's chest. I float and swirl atop the froth, bumping birth, a log cast off. To the middle we appeal, spandex clad, Conversation streams afresh. Male tubbers anxious to explain their hurdles, exercise routines, the latest diet, gluten-free, non-GMO, probiotic, replaces organic. Try it. Women who sauna gossip are silent in the tub, out and in, out and in, wrinkly as clotted cream, spa jets, White noise melts. Top 10 feet, spoken word, football slayers, acapella accents, mejores, zhuzhao, bast, finesse. Social misfit showing his butt. Not enough spaces for the rest to look away. We grim, grin tenacious. A human soupy mix. Salt, no politics. Still in those pants, uh, Porphyry Basin, San Juan Mountains. Wanting to say, another kind of said. Lightning in photographs, beautiful, held back. A little too much daylight, laked brain blue. Impossibly white, the carriage overall. Your muscle, my muscle, could have been your love, sweet things I could do. Water underneath, black talus, leaves burning, invisible rush. Willing me, willingness, smalling the earth. No bin, relax. This time we live forever. And I have one more. It's um, just a, 
homage to the sun and the earth. Good morning, poem. Good morning, golden bear. At six, we watch you cross the river, cleansing your paws in the cold white water. Later, when we are busy with our happiness, you amble across the sky in search of nothing. We remember as you sleep in the hills, your breath now caught inside each leaf, and we run about in the darkness, laughing and dancing as you did. Thank you. And, and let's see who's uh, next. Wendy. Linda. Oh, no. Linda. Linda's next, and I think that's it for the poetry this evening. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Linda White, and I'm one of those people who's been at Pen and Pencil for a really, really, really long time. And everything that Llewellyn said about the group is absolutely true. They're a wonderful group. If anyone here is looking to join a writing group, I highly recommend us. Okay, I'm gonna read something that I was inspired by um, my commute every day. And for those of us who go to work on a regional rail line, there may be some things that sound familiar. It's called A Day in the Life, 2018. <clears throat> Next stop, 30th Street Station. This is a wheelchair accessible station with connections to, I rode the train today, oh boy. All righty, well it's just another Silver Liner Symphony. As we zip along the back tracks through Mount Airy, Germantown in North Philadelphia, I watch Ms. L'Oreal applying makeup as if she was preparing for her close-up. Moisturizer, primer, pause 10 seconds to let it set. Foundation, concealer, contour powders, lipstick, eyeliner, mascara. Brushes and pots gathered in her lap like tots waiting for story time. Fingers covered in cocoa, peanut, and smoke-colored paste. She went from blank face to Kim Kardashian face in 25 minutes. Gave herself cheekbones and perfectly arched eyebrows that make her look perpetually surprised. Another lady applied deodorant. I guess I should be grateful. I'm certainly more optimistic for her coworkers. I hope they show her the same courtesy. The new conductor whose false eyelashes make her look like the love child of Bambi and RuPaul marched down the aisle demanding, all fares, please. The guy sitting next to me whose breath smelled like cattle at 7.30 in the morning, he yawned and exhaled regularly. Yesterday I was on a train I was pulling out of the station when a woman came charging down the platform, hysterically screaming, no, and banging on the side of the train. Next stop, nervous breakdown. The train stopped, and a bored-looking conductor opened a door for her. Rush hour trains are always crowded, but the quiet car is always quiet, except when it's not. Occasionally, someone boards with a giant coffee carrier, yapping on a cell phone about how hungover she is, or how much she hates Drusilla, that lazy-ass co-worker who broke three beakers while she was setting up the lab yesterday. Sometimes, someone whose music leaks from their earbuds sits next to me. It sounds like muffled cries for help are coming from their hat. I can relate. Okay, now I'm at the office. What madness awaits that great doom buckle of taxpayer money that I call my job? Who's going to harass who today? Will it be the insecure deputy director who stomps around in chewed high heels? and greets everybody with chummy cliches before she throws them under the bus? Will it be the inept deputy who changed his title to Il Duce? Will it be the lumpy turd who just told one of the women who, works, who reports to him that she was wearing fuck me boots? Rumors are that he lives out of his 10-year-old Lexus sedan. Maybe it'll be the crinkly old crone who has a penchant for belittling people she doesn't see as her equals basically black and brown women. 
She told the new deputy to go fetch a $5 sushi lunch for her. Remember the dude she used to ask to find her company car because she forgot where she parked it? He eventually got fired. Who's gonna lose their shit today? Will it be the executive assistant whose ear-splitting screams of, they all hate me, routinely pierced the soundtrack of clicking keys and the hum of the microwave? Somebody get that girl a Pepsi, stat. I'll probably hear the resident Kelly Bundy rant, why does everybody ask me if I'm sleeping with him? Well, maybe it's because you are. Then when you say, what would that get me? I want to say, a disease. <laughs> Doesn't she know that he put the hoe in Lothari hoe? Yesterday, somebody found a bed bug in her chair. Mass hysteria, pleas to go home early, demands to have every upholstered surface fumigated, lungs and nervous system be damned. Poor Babs bedbug ended up displayed on a strip of scotch tape in the special assistant's office. Eight people jammed the room to ogle the unfortunate little critter while assistants sat with the phone receiver pressed to her ear waiting for verification of its species. One colleague came in to draw a circle around it, kind of like the chalk mark drawn around the corpse on Law & Order. Made some folks itchy, made others want to take a shower. So what's the jackpot for Mega Millions this week? Eight hours later, my day is done. No lives lost, no money wasted. Two items ticked off the to-do list, four more added. Coworkers found joy in a platter of room temperature cold cuts and potato salad left over from a meeting. Thoughtful questions from coworkers. How come there are no cookies on that other tray? Did you smell it first? <laughs> Contented coos from those who got an extra pickle. <laughs> I'm on my way home on the 521 that arrived at 528. I'm on the quiet car again, sitting behind an overworked young mother with a chatty toddler. Mom keeps her eyes glued to the iPhone that she has in a white knuckled grip. She's got to feel the daggers from the eyes of other passengers who just want to take a nap before they get home. Ms. L'Oreal's morning face has shifted with the stress of the day. One eyebrow has disappeared. <laughs> and her carefully contoured cheekbones have migrated to her south, south to her jawline. The evening conductor announces in a gravelly voice that no one can use transit passes during rush hour. Sounds like he'll bounce you off the train in the middle of a barren field if you even think about scamming him. All the morning wetheads are dry, brushed out, pinned up. Soft pretzels take the place of ginormous coffee carriers. Smudges of mustard on fingers and cheeks. Breaths smell like spicy brown. Waiting to board. Everyone has their star on the floor and they hit the mark while they wait feet firm, exerting the only control they had all day where they sit for the ride home. Some days I feel like I was running against the wind, worn down, deflated, scared. But I find the courage to keep going. Sometimes I gotta dig deep. Pushing against the pushback, the wait your turn, not qualified, we want someone younger. It's your fault, firecrackers, that are tossed at me. I keep going when I make mistakes, live to regret, choose the blind path. What if I snatch off the calm mask, the supportive mask, the rational mask? What if I rant, shove, stomp on toes? It takes courage to wear my brand as troublemaker and instigator without flinching. Courage to keep going when I know I'm not winning. Sometimes the finish line pulls further away the closer I get. Hell, sometimes it takes courage just to cross the street, the crossroads of life, the intersection of anger and courage. It's exhausting. But I've got the courage to keep pushing on, pushing ahead, pushing with hope, pushing against hope, hoping to push, push aside revenge fantasies. Most days, I turn my purple rage into gold with a smile. Pour me a glass of red, honey, and I'll tell you about my day.
Hi, my name is <clears throat> Wendy Washburn, and I'm working on a young adult novel called Thunderbird Field Book. I'll be reading an excerpt from the journal of the main character, 16-year-old Janet Larkin. Llewellyn has agreed to help me out by playing two other characters, Janet's aunt and Janet's high school teacher. First, though, I start with an 1889 quotation from Reverend Myron Eels. Among the strange links which bind together the numerous tribes of Western America is the myth of the Thunderbird. The general idea among the Indians is that thunder is caused by an immense bird whose size darkens the heavens, whose body is the thunder cloud, the flapping of whose wings causes the thunder, and the bolts of fire, which it sends out of its mouth to kill the whale for its food, or the lightning. Now, <coughs> now the story starts. Um, when I told my parents that for my school summer science project, I wanted to go on a whale walk, watching kayaking tour. They were all for it until I explained that to meet the minimum time for completing the assignment, I would need to go on at least 10 tours, costing a total of about $1,500. They suggested several cheap but incredibly <coughs> lame alternatives, like beach combing or backyard bird watching. I explained to them that all I wanted to do was study whales. Whales were my thing, as they knew. Hadn't I even gotten them to donate to Greenpeace and Sea Shepherd? Also, I told them sternly, I had already submitted the plan to my science teacher who had approved it and I didn't know if it was possible to change it. After considering my argument for almost a minute, they insisted my teacher would understand the financial considerations and their final offer was to make, take me camping in the nearby Olympic National Park to take pictures of moss and lichens, admire the beauty of the turquoise Skokomish River and maybe catch a glimpse of an elk herd. As we have camped there almost every summer of my life, I politely refused by slamming the front door and biking to my great aunt Nina's dark brown California bungalow, where I intended to spend the evening complaining about them, a sport that Nina always enjoys. <laughs> also, I hoped she would offer to pay for the whale expeditions. I found Nina standing at her kitchen counter, wearing her usual camo cargo pants and black sweatshirt, staring at the screen of her laptop. She is my dad's aunt and 65 years old, with short pure white hair and a face leathered from a life spent hiking in all kinds of weather all over the Olympic Mountains. Though technically considered elderly, she is, needless to say, in much better shape than anyone I know, young or old. She looked up and smiled a greeting as I stomped into the kitchen, ready to get angsty. But before I could start, she pointed in annoyance at her computer screen. I can't believe how expensive these coffins are. <laughs> and they're even half off today. And I can't decide which one to buy. It has to be environmentally friendly, of course. I've heard wicker has become very popular, but the bamboo is sleeker, and this willow model is just lovely. Which one do you like? She scrolled up and down a website displaying an array of coffin options that ranged from 800 to thousands of dollars. I opened my mouth to answer, but didn't know what to say since I was now suddenly worried that she was dying. Aunt Nina, what's going on? Are you sick? No, no. It occurred to me today that given the potential dangers of my profession, I could end up dying any day by a fall off a cliff, bear mauling, even a simple car wreck. At my age... Come on, you'll probably outlive me. So I was wondering if you could write my obituary. You're so creative. I know you can write something moving, yet also witty. I've started a list of highlights from my life that you can include. Nina Larkin was the foremost cryptozoologist in the Pacific Northwest, having identified and pursued more cryptids than anyone else. She was the cryptozoologist consultant on such popular television shows as True Tales and Beast Files. Nina lived life as if there were no tomorrow, until finally there was no tomorrow, <laughs> at least for her, or you know, something to that effect. I scrolled through clevercoffins.com, custom designed <laughs> coffins and caskets, and couldn't believe the styles of coffins for sale. <laughs> Coffins that looked exactly like giant lunchbox, a car, Egyptian sarcophagus, a spaceship, or a teepee. If you preferred a traditional shape, you could choose from various materials, such as wicker, bamboo, thatch, plaster, and glass. Anything but plain old wood. Nina is a hopeless online shopper, always falling down rabbit holes while browsing websites, so it's just like her to end up at clevercoffins.com. If something is weird and unusual for someone her age, she's all for it, and my fairly normal parents just don't get her. Before she became famous, she was poor, working part-time for the National Park Service and living in a trailer somewhere in the woods. I especially remember one day when my dad was upset with her for talking about buying some expensive cameras for a camera trap, which is essential for hunting Sasquatch. 
He started yelling at her. Why do you waste your life away? Bigfoot doesn't exist and you know it. Why can't you get a better job, earn money, and support yourself? He was sorry for the outburst and apologized, but Nina was so mortified that we didn't hear from her for weeks. When she resurfaced, she had created a website called The Cryptid Crone and uploaded the records of her cryptid hunts through the years with funny stories about her explorations and lots of location pictures and creature drawings. Before long, the website had caught on, TV producers started calling, and the rest is history. Now she has enough money to live in a much better neighborhood than we do, and I never get tired of reminding my dad of that. Oops, I forgot. That should be red. <laughs> so what brings you here on a Saturday night, Jeanette? <laughs> Mom and dad are being horribly unfair. I have this summer science project I have to do for school, and they refuse to help me pay for whale watching. Well, you know that money is a sensitive subject with them. How much did you ask for? Just $1,500. It's not that much. One of my friends is going down to South America to volunteer for an archaeological dig. Believe me, that's not cheap. But your parents are cheap, <laughs> so keep your expectations low. But I want to study whales. I, I can see myself learning so much about marine biology, and this project will look really good on my high school transcript. I just need to find some money for it. Hmm. Hmm. I might have an opportunity for you if you're willing to help me out with my new cryptid hunt. My first impulse was to scream with frustration since I didn't think Nina's hunts had anything to do with real science and because she didn't even consider helping me out with the whale idea. But I managed to keep my mouth shut and just said, oh? Harry Palmer thinks we might find a thunderbird this summer since there have been more thunderstorms than usual along the coast. He has some good leads, so I agreed to partner with him for a few weeks could make for some good posts for the website. I don't know if my teacher would approve that. She wouldn't think cryptid hunting is science. You can tell your teacher that we'll be following clues left behind by a mysterious bird unknown yet to science. You don't need to mention the word Thunderbird. Think about it and let me know soon. I went home disappointed and a little hurt. Nina had plenty of money and could have helped me if she wanted but I had to accept that whales were out for good. I was embarrassed to email my science teacher, Ms. Matting, and ask about changing the subject of my project. Even if I took Nina's advice and didn't mention the word Thunderbird, my report would have to say it sooner or later, at which time Ms. Matting would realize I had misrepresented the animal being studied. Finally, I decided not to hide anything. Expecting an emphatic no, I emailed her that I would not be able to research whales after all, but that my aunt, Nina Larkin, had invited me to help her investigate possible sightings of the Thunderbird. Ms. Manning's reply was not what I expected. Is your aunt the Nina Larkin? Beast Files, Nina Larkin? Yes, the same. I love that show. Is this investigation going to be a Beast Files episode next season? I don't know. Maybe if we find evidence of anything, but I'll definitely let you know. So my project idea is OK? Oh, yes, of course. I was so surprised at that answer that I wondered if she understood what I was asking. So I said, but the Thunderbird is just a Native American legend. How can a science project be about a myth? Just make sure to put sciencey stuff in your field notes. You know, <laughs> observations and <laughs> drawings of plants and animals you come across, that sort of thing. The science project is supposed to be fun, so don't worry about it. And please do keep me updated. Good luck. Jeez, famous TV personalities make even science teachers weak at the knees. <laughs> I'm Sam Smith. Uh, the name of this story is Punctuated Equilibrium. Candace carefully closed the door behind her. Alan kept his head down, intent on his laptop at the kitchen table. Once, she would have wanted to pet his shaggy head as she walked past. But two writers in one small apartment had to obey rules. One of the most important don't be a distraction. She passed from the kitchen into the other room, which served as their bedroom, their living room, and her office. On her desk chair was a stack of papers she hadn't put there. She picked it up. Alan had printed out her latest chapter. His red scratchings were everywhere on the page. Candace ricocheted back to the kitchen table. She stood next to Alan, who continued to ignore her. She flung the stack of paper on his MacBook, and it cascaded onto the table 
his lap the floor. Hey, Alan said, looking up. We have rules. You're supposed to stay out of my stuff, my laptop and my writing. I wanted to help. I don't want your help. Don't you want it to be better? Don't you mean more like you? Alan was silent, still staring. Oh, fuck you, Candace said. You're not a better writer than me. Your characters talk in semicolons. <laughs> Alan said, you may not know people that talk in semicolons. He smirked. Semicolon, however, <laughs> comma, I do, period. It occurred to Candace that she would have to step back if she wanted to hit him really hard. <laughs> Instead, she said, I'm breaking up with you. Alan's eyes widened. You're breaking up with me over grammar? No, I'm breaking up with you because you think I'm breaking up with you over grammar. Candace spun on her heel. She thought, I will not flounce. I will not flounce. So I'm working on a novel, and uh, I'm going to read the last half of one of the chapters, and I'll try to do a little introduction here before I get started. My name's Curtis Embry. The name of the novel is Jam. So the narrator of this story is a guy named Jim, and he's kind of a contradiction. He's a Hollywood agent, and he's a nice guy. Uh, <laughs> he met a girl in college and became her manager. They got married, and she is now the number one at the box office. She's kind of the it girl of the day, and her name is Jam. And she divorced him three years ago. As we start the story, it's 2003, and Jim has negotiated a big movie deal for a high school dropout named Billy. Billy's about to become the next James Dean. They're both in Jim's Cadillac convertible when he gets a, car, a call on the car's phone. It's Jam. She tells him that she needs him now, and then she gives a gasp of pain and hangs up. Our heroic duo races off to Jam's house in the Hollywood Hills, determined to rescue the princess. And so this is where we pick up the story. <clears throat> the wrought iron gate that blocks the entry to Hildago Ranch is itself nearly blocked by a small herd of Chevy Malibus and Toyota Camrys. A bored LAPD traffic officer keeps the way clear, the paparazzi had arrived a few months ago on the day after Jam disappeared from sight. She had locked herself away, and everyone out front knew they'd lose their jobs if they weren't there when she broke her silence. It wasn't supposed to be a long wait. Jam wasn't a recluse. But months had passed, and the reporters had created their own sleepy little community out front. But they stir as we tear up. They recognize my car. As we pull up to the gate, cameras click and questions fill the air. It's Billy's first exposure to his new public life. He welcomes it with a gutsy, fuck off. <laughs> That's the start of many happy exchanges he will have with the press during his career. I'm sorry I hadn't raised the car's convertible top. At the front gate is a keypad lock. I punch in the familiar code, my hands shaking. The gate opens, and with a squeal of tires, we shoot through. The reporters know to stay behind the magic line. It could get them arrested for trespassing in this neighborhood, and their rivals would gleefully supply photographic evidence. The Hildago homestead is a massive adobe structure with a red clay tile roof. A trim young Latina is waiting for us in the driveway. She's dressed in a tailored gray suit over a classic white Oxford shirt with a bright red scarf tied at her neck. In spite of what must be going on inside, she's amazingly cool and efficient. Unlike me, I'm a nervous wreck. Jim, good to finally meet you. My name is Maria. Please follow me quickly. Jam is calling for no one but you. We head through the house and out the back, across an enclosed courtyard and through a wide gate in the back wall. We follow a brick path that leads to the guest house. 
For all the elegance of the main house, when Jam has a difficult time, she prefers this quiet hideaway. But right now, the guest house is a busy place. An older man and a strong middle-aged woman turn to us as we enter, and they're both dressed in hospital scrubs. The house has been redecorated since I'd seen it last. The furniture in the open living space is gone, replaced by stainless steel cabinets, linoleum countertops, and various wheeled carts carrying medical equipment. In the middle sits a large hospital bed where my ex-wife is lying peacefully. I don't need to call an ambulance. Jam is well cared for, and my knees go weak with relief. Jam is all comfy, but she looks like she's in the last sprint of a 5K. Her face is flushed and sweaty, her chestnut hair escaping out of what used to be a ponytail. Most surprising of all, her belly is swollen beyond anything her slim frame should be able to manage. Good Lord, my ex-wife is pregnant, and she is in labor. Anyone else in a motherly way would have called her closest friend months ago. I'm upset she hasn't at least sent me a card. But I forgive her instantly, and I step up and take her hand. She's wearing a tie-dyed hospital gown. It drapes modestly over her Mount Everest-sized belly, and her raised knees form the foothills. After the initial scare, seeing her conscious and in good health, I've lost all focus. She watches me expectedly, so I blurt out the first thing that comes to mind. Well, this is another fine mess you've gotten us into. And about time you joined in the fun, Mr. Fancy Pants, she replies. Now, you've left me speechless again. What's your plan? I'm busy having a baby. You're supposed to take over from here. Okie dokie, I glance around at our audience. Why don't we start with introductions? So Jam introduces her new entourage one at a time. That beautiful lady dressed in gray is Maria. She's my angel, my bodyguard, and my current best girlfriend. Maria blushes and smiles. Jam smiles back, then gasps and pauses for a contraction. She takes a couple deep breaths before continuing. <clears throat> Next is the sweetest and most competent baby delivery man on the planet, Dr. Simon. The good doctor takes a goofy little bow. Standing at his side is this year's Nurse Rat Shit Award winner, Betty. <laughs> Betty nods to Jam with motherly care. Her calm demeanor appears to bring a great deal of professional competence to the proceedings. And last, that handsome young lad dressed in black, Jam points back in the corner at Billy, who looks like he's about to pass out. He is, she turns to me. Who is he anyway? Well, don't you know it's good luck to invite a stranger to your life-changing events, I offer? Jam gives me a look that says I've gone off script. I think that only applies to weddings, and this isn't a life changer, it's a momentary pause. My befuddled brain finds the traction it needs and leaps into gear with a rush of questions, but I don't have a chance to ponder them because Jam inhales sharply and starts panting. Everyone steps into action. Nurse Betty pushes me out of the way, props her arm under Jam's shoulders and lifts Jam up into a sitting position. Maria grabs a washcloth from the sink and moves to Jam's other side to assist. The doctor steps up to the end of the bed and lifts her hospital gown aside. Meanwhile in the corner, Billy makes a run for the door and almost <laughs> makes it, but faints and collapses on the threshold. I stand aside and consider what Jam has just said. Her offhand remark about a momentary pause makes it clear to me she isn't going to keep the baby. So will the father be showing up to claim it? And why did she call me instead of him? Three years ago, I moved out of the house and out of Jam's life, and I haven't heard from her since. She must have a plan. Well, she always has a plan, no matter how ridiculous it may seem to others. Billy and I were lucky enough to arrive just in time for the grand finale, although it looks like Billy's going to miss it. <laughs> I, I focus on Jam's face, which is now bright red, her features compressed in concentration. She takes three last deep breaths, opens her eyes, and relaxes into Betty's arm. The doctor gives an excited yip, and the sound of a baby's cry catches everyone's attention. A reverent stillness fills the room. I've experienced something like this only once before, and that other time, Jam was on location in Europe for her second picture, The Lost Souls. I was along for moral support. It's a high story about stealing the Hungarian crown jewels. Jam's character is a master thief and a loner, 
but she falls in love with the reigning monarch's son, Prince Charming somebody. The production was filming exteriors on a warm summer night in Budapest. The Hungarian movie crew and all their cables, lights, and cameras and trailers had commandeered the side entrance to St. Stephen's Basilica, a classic European cathedral in the center of town. It was a typical film shoot dragging on past 11 p.m., the entire cast and crew exhausted because we'd all started the day at 4.30 that morning. Now, at a shoot, there's always more time between takes than you could imagine. One day's work might produce just a few minutes of actual film. We had reached a lull where the Key Grips crew got busy resetting lights for the next camera angle. Jam slipped up to me, grabbed my hand, and pulled me away. She gave me a mischievous look as we headed out of the lights toward the back of the cathedral. I knew what she had in mind, or at least I hoped I did. A small giggle and a quick kiss on the cheek from Jam confirmed it. Feeling punchy from the long night, I giggled too. When we turned the back corner, we found an open door with a warm glow of candlelight pouring out. We stepped inside and our giggles were swallowed up by a rich, deep quiet. A short vestibule opened into a small chapel. It wasn't the massive grandeur of the main sanctuary out front, but instead it was a simple place where a half a dozen priests were singing the doxology for midnight mass. We stood still engulfed in a peace that was filled with life. And at the Hildalgo guest house, I'm feeling the same sense of the eternal I experienced at St. Stephen's. Nurse Betty holds up the red-faced bundle for everyone to see. She's a girl. She turns to give the baby to Jam, but Jam looks at me. You take her. And just like that, I became a father. Massey, and I'll be reading an excerpt from the first chapter of my uh, science fiction novel, The Peoples of Kanash. <clears throat> the crew of the shuttle Aurora had headed to happy hour at Circle's End after a successful test flight earlier in the week, followed by days of grueling debriefing. Today they had finally been able to take off work at 1700 hours and headed to the to happy hour at the Circle's End Bar and Cafe, not far from Kopec headquarters on the Starship Beetle. Last round's on me, shouted Yannick Bardo, the ship's cap, uh, operations officer. This one's to Lady Luck. May she shine her light on us. This is a bar, not a casino. Who gave you the last round, shouted uh, Carl Mason, the mission's exobiologist, good-naturedly. I'll toast to science, engineering, and the able bodies and fertile minds. Fertile minds, shouted Bordeaux gleefully. This is a bar, not a growth chamber car, teased Audria Hafez, a mission geologist, with a smile. The others were laughing, and she pinged him with a, metal, uh, with a mental note, silly, via Neuronet, to reassure him. In the unruly den of the bar, Marson hardly noticed her ping. Well, here's to human fertility then, mental or otherwise, especially otherwise, shouted Bordeaux with a flourish, raising his glass. You should talk, laughed co-pilot Jorge and Bono. I bet my go daddies, countered Bordeaux with a mock defensiveness. Bordeaux had confirmed, was a confirmed bachelor but he had made his contribution to the genetic diversity of the colony by donating to the sperm bank. It's the other more ancillary benefits of fertility I was thinking about, he added wryly. And Bono laughed and shot back, careful, there's family types among us. Well, see no evil, hear no evil, whatever, said Bordeaux, raising his empty shot glass. Barkeep, whatever they're all having, another round on me. It's maitre de bar to you, Lieutenant, 
said the bartender with re pretended aloofness. I'm uh, up. Bordeaux's rejoinder was interrupted by a stifled burp. An optician, you say, quipped the bartender. Yeah, so fill our glasses, said Bordeaux, holding his and Mbono's empty glasses in front of his eyes. They all laughed at the archaic reference. The crew enjoyed the happy-go-lucky antics of their uh, youngest crewmate, knowing that when on duty, he could be relied, be relied on to uh, show the same rock-solid focus and attention to details of the mission that he now showed to letting off steam. Capsule communicator for the Aurora mission, Jeremy Stone, held up his hand, smiling. Sorry, I'd better bow out now. Got a family at home and work tomorrow. Oh, 800 hours sharp, folks. He got up to leave. Yeah, me too, said Hafez, getting up. You got the kids to snuggle in. Pilot and mission commander Christy Auger said, yeah, better pull out too. Have fun, boys. The boys took, their, took her jibe like men, giving each other smug sideways glances. As Stone and the two women got up to leave, Marson shot a quick glance at Audrey, who gave him a friendly wink as she turned to leave. He was single by force of circumstance rather than by conviction, unlike Bordo and Imbono. A teetotaler by preference, he wouldn't have been at the bar except for the camaraderie of the crew. He waffled a second and said, uh, yeah, me too. Work in the morning, see you at 0800. He tries to say it good-naturedly, but it felt forced. Bordo and Mbono looked at each other, lifted their glasses, and said almost together, 0800 and stayed for, a long, uh, for another round before headed, uh, heading to their quarters in the sprawling Kopec astronautics complex. Marson took his leave, still fe feeling a bit embarrassed by his awkward toast. By the time he got to the door, Stone, Hafez, and Auger had disappeared into the nearby tube station. He had hoped to catch up with them, but instead he took the next car to his flat in a condominium not far from Kopec head headquarters. When he got home, he ordered a meal of cultured beef and vegetable stew from the food service by Neuronet to balance uh, the happy hour fare he had consumed at the bar. Vegetables on Beagle were mostly harvested from growth chambers, and the cultured meat in his stew was grown in tissue culture. Animal meat raised in, in uh, various biomes of the huge cylindrical ramas was in limited supply and very expensive. Real meat and cultured meat tasted pretty much the same, except for the texture. Marson preferred the, uh, Marson preferred the more uniform texture of cultured meat anyway. When the meal arrived five minutes later at the dispensary terminal in his kitchenette, he took it out and went to the sofa in the small living room of his flat to eat. He mentally switched on the wall screen to watch the news. He preferred, to, he preferred to watch the news on the screen rather than my direct neuro feed because it was more relaxing, less demanding of attention while he ate. Much was happening on Earth-3 colony, a fleet of huge paired cylindrical vessels scattered around the system of the Star Denison 17, mostly in the asteroid belts where they were being resupplied with raw materials after the last leg of their 427-year migration from Earth's solar system. The huge twin Ramas had been fitted for the harsh conditions of relativistic travel through space, but a new generation of habitats was being constructed as permanent fixtures of the D-17 system. These traded the massive mass ram drives for interstellar, uh, interstellar acceleration and deceleration for more modest fusion engines suitable for orbital maneuvering within the D-17 system. Marson followed this, uh, the progress of habitat construction in the belt with great interest. It was the counter theme to planetary colonization in the debate over the ethics and desirability of descending into a gravity well to invade and contaminate an alien ecosystem with Terran organisms. Many colonists, the colonizers, were deeply committed to finding and, po and populating a new Earth out among the stars as their reason for being. And it was to this end that COPEC, the core of planetary exploration and colonization, had been established. 
Others preferred the advantages and comforts of living in the huge orbital habitats. They had grown quite comfortable in space and preferred to avoid the expense and difficulties of navigating in a gravity well. Marson, as exobiologist, would prefer that any exoplanet, including D-17D, be studied scientifically but allowed to develop on its own without Terran contamination. But having been raised on Earth-3 colony during its interstellar voyage, he knew it would be next to impossible to dissuade the colonizers from realizing the completion of their quest for a new planetary home. His reasons for caution were scientific and rational. Life on D-17D was very different from Terran life in every way from anatomy to basic biochemistry. But the most troubling concern to Marson was that the Galenian and Terran biomes were toxic to each other. Marson had been strident in his call for caution, and this had often aligned him in policy debates with radical indigenous groups such as Indy Peace, who believed in sovereign rights for indigenous species on any planet, whatever they might be, and that colonization of D-17D should therefore be forbidden. But he detested the, these groups for their moralistic and anti-scientific ideology and at times violent agenda. Many of them had been puzzled, some outraged, when he dropped his faculty position at Charles Darwin University to join COPEC as a planetary explorer. It seemed to contradict everything they thought of him or wanted him to be. But to him it was an obvious choice. He was fascinated with the alien ecosystem and eager to study it, but he wanted to see it done right. And he thought he could influence the policy of COPEC, where his earlier work on detoxifying enzymes and, ca and his caution, cautious approach to cross-contamination of biomes was understood and appreciated. But as he watched the news and took in the political dogfights that were erupting over these issues throughout the colony, he wondered to what end the whole enterprise would come. Hello, my name is Stephanie Kent, and I have a short story to read. Um, and as luck would have it, the story is about my son, and he doesn't know the, the content of the story, and he called me right right before I was coming. And I told him that it was streaming live. So it's possible. It's po Nick, if you're watching, <laughs> I hope you're happy. <laughs> so the story is called The Rabbit Who Thought He Was a Dragon. Will I ever tell him what I did? What will be his reaction? Would the truth change the trajectory of his life? Did it have any impact? What would have been different? What would be different now? Is the truth what he needs now for a course correction, for a full rounding of his development? I do think that someday I'll tell him, maybe one day when he has children of his own, maybe tonight, there may be some, <laughs> there may be some moment when it will be the perfect time. It will make things come together in his life or make everything fall apart. Once he knows, he could lose all his confidence and see his entire life and self-perception as being based on a lie. Or he would see that he is the rabbit who thought he was a dragon and became both. I should tell the tale from the beginning. It was winter, it was a bitter night, and everyone was bundled up so tight that the little ones were more like bags of laundry. Red-cheeked and excited, the family was out for an evening at a Chinese New Year celebration. The oldest brother was in charge, telling his younger sibling all about the things they were seeing and doing, even though it was clear he had never been to Chinatown and really had no idea what he was talking about. Yet he spoke with such authority to the small, wide-eyed, brown-haired little boy that there was no question his words were not only truth but wisdom shared. The older boy had a nerdy, uptight manner about him, self-assured and smart-looking, wearing his clothes just a little bit too tucked in. The younger boy, about six or seven, had a sweet, handsome, but nervous face with dark brown eyes, snappy dimples when he smiled, but that was rare. He had a scared, hesitant expression on his face that didn't seem to leave. The other two children, also boys, were babies, a squirmy toddler in arms and another, an infant, asleep in the car seat and toted around like a package. Mother and father were preoccupied with the smaller ones so much, so much of the companionships that the two older boys had was with each other. It was clear who was in charge. 
The mother and father engage with the two older boys on the periphery, listening in on their conversations and sending each other knowing it looks like, good grief, is Nikki really buying all of this? Once in a while, a correction would be made, something like, that's really not the case. Or, hey, let Nikki do it himself, it's okay. Or, hey, Nick has been trying to tell you something, why don't you let him speak? The dynamic was adorable. The younger boy's clear devotion to and adoration for the older boy was evident. They were all excited to sit at a large round table covered with a deep red cloth. There's something about that shade of red that transports you into the Chinese culture. The room was bustling, church members and friends all talking and chatting, folks coming over to exclaim how big the boys were getting, how cute the baby was. The squirmy toddler was a climber and was scaling the golden chairs and from time to time would make it up to the table. The dad was in a constant state of motion, somehow managing to hold on to the child, keeping him safe, yet still having a conversation with other adults and an ear to the two older boys. Finally, everyone took their assigned seats for the festivities to start. Announcements were made describing the types of food that would be arriving, the decorations, and the meaning of the beautiful imagery around them. At each place was a colorful placemat that had the Chinese zodiac with all the animals and descriptions of each. On the side and bottom of the symbols in very small print was how to determine which animal you were. The mom carefully looked over the chart and determined the father's symbol. A tiger. Oh, my. Then she carefully did the same for the oldest boy symbol, a bull, very powerful. And as she described each animal, they seemed to reflect each of the personalities so well. All very manly. Dad and the oldest boy seemed proud. Mom then carefully looked over the chart, looking for Nikki's symbol. Without even a pause, a decision was made. A fast reader, she skimmed the descriptions, the dates, what it could mean, and in the blink of an eye, the decision was made for all time. The younger boy's symbol was on the cusp of both the dragon and the rabbit. If he had been born just a few hours earlier, he would squarely be on a day that would have made him a dragon. But alas, he was a rabbit. However, she decided differently. Without a pause, she declared, Nick, you are a white metal dragon. Wow. Oh my goodness, that's the most powerful of the symbols. The entire table seemed to pause, looking at this small, scrawny little guy who followed his brother around with a nervous look on his face. Okay, if that's what it is, then that's what it is, seemed to be the sentiment. Nick was stunned, but pleased. He looked at his older brother as if for confirmation, but did not receive it. Just a shrug. In the back of her mind, she thought, will there be a day of reckoning? What will be the consequences of this little lie? My small, skinny little rabbit with hesitancy in every expression, waiting to be eaten, what will happen if he thinks he's a dragon? What will happen if he thinks he's a dragon? Many years and many, mo many moments later, that rabbit decided to be a wrestler, a runner, a traveler, afraid but willing to risk failure and the unknown again and again. The rabbit faced moments like when his arm was broken during a brutal wrestling tournament that I watched, where he was wrestling kids that seemed to have twice as many muscles and 10 times more meanness and likely really were dragons, he decided at each one of those moments that he was in the game. That rabbit decided after breaking that same arm two more times and end enduring a grueling six months recovery from the last nasty break that in fact he was a wrestler and he healed and came out of his cast for the third time and the bolts were removed from his bones, he decided that yes, he would fight again and went back to practice and went to states his senior year. When that rabbit got put into Mandarin class randomly his freshman year, he decided he would apply for an international program that would take him away from his family and on a plane to China at 14. He decided he had wings. When that rabbit decided to go back to China the following summer, he was told there was one thing the students could not, absolutely not do. For health reasons, legal reasons, based on age restrictions, and to be in line with the program policy, under no circumstances could you even think about getting a tattoo. That rabbit took himself off the next day to a tattoo parlor and got what? A dragon tattooed on his hip. The day after that, three other teens in the program also got tattoos. The rabbit was not asked to return the following summer. <laughs> his, his junior year, that little rabbit decided he would run for cross country. When he got a stress fracture because his bones were not quite strong enough to handle the pace and mileage he was putting on his body, he continued running, doing the excruciating trust stretching and exercises to counter the fracture. He placed, he placed one spot away from going to states. That, the rabbit 
that rabbit, the summer after he graduated high school, applied for and won a scholarship to travel across three Chinese provinces on what? The dragon trip. Of course, he was on his own at 18, speaking fluent Chinese and making his way across rural China to meet up with his group. Maybe there'd be some other dragons he would meet. That rabbit had become a dragon, a thick-skinned, enormous, scaly, brown, muscly dragon with talons and wings and strangely long ears <laughs> and a slightly twitchy nose. Once in a while, that look, scared and hesitant, appears on the dragon's face when he's troubled or sad. That rabbity dragon also breathes fire and holds keggers in the house when the parents aren't home, and Jack walks kids who are way bigger than him out of his house when they enter a room that was off limits. When it came time to select a college, that rabbit decided he most definitely had wings and flew himself off to Colorado exactly one day after returning home from China where he can be found now, causing mayhem and making a warrant of friends. That rabbit is picking fights in bars, baiting guys much larger than himself, and telling his mother about it. When he gets, and he gets knocked down pretty quickly and arrested, that rabbit then calls his mom, crying and asking, oh my god, will this affect my record? What if I were to work with small children? <laughs> there might be a moment of reckoning coming, a time to sit down and to have a conversation with Smog on the Lonely Mountain but it hasn't happened yet. As for now, I'm enjoying watching this large, rabbit-like, dragony creature fly in and out of my life with fire and excitement, and sometimes the need to hide in a snug little rabbity hole, which happens to be filled with gold. So my name's Matt. I'm going to be reading from a fantasy novel that I've been working on um, called Awakening, and I'll be introducing everyone to a character named Patrick. Um, just a little context about Patrick. He's a high school senior. He sleeps late. He calls his mother by his fir her first name when she annoys him, which is all the time. Uh, he has a crush on a girl he's barely spoken to. Um, her name is Shilpa, and we'll be introduced to her as well. Um, so I'll start with Patrick in school, and the only other piece that's important is this is the anxiety-filled weeks when people are figuring out what to do about prom dates. Okay. Um, the walls in the classroom were bare of decorations. No maps, no periodic table, no musical instruments. It was neutral, empty of any personality. The teacher, who had dominion over this space when Patrick had study hall, was sandy-haired and tall. He rarely said much of anything, insisting on dutiful silence to fill his study hall. This is not to say he was impolite, but rather clear on the purpose of what study hall was designed for. He graded papers and frequently ate his lunch. Today, he was eating pretzels. The snap of the pretzel was distracting but eventually it blended in with the shuffling of papers and exasperated exhales of bored and tired students. Patrick sat in the front row. Today, he did not have anything to work on. In these instances, there were two prohibitions. One could not listen to music, no matter how softly, nor whisper to a friend. One could read a book for pleasure or practice future assignments. One could also nap. Patrick dozed and periodically would jolt awake. It felt unnatural to sleep in class, and he was concerned he could be caught for doing something wrong. When he would jolt awake, the teacher would look up and smile at him, his brown eyes twinkling. Patrick awoke to a pounding as fists thudded against the plastic desk. He rubbed his eyes and shook the sleep from his head. The teacher stood above him, his face pale, his hands grabbing at his throat. Other students gasped and yelled, someone help him, we should call the nurse, and fuck, he's choking. Patrick, Patrick sat still as terror rose inside of him. Oh shit, shit, someone needs to do the Heimlich, shit, who knows how to do that? His words ran together, matching his jumbled thoughts. A student rushed out of the room and Patrick's heartbeat quickened. The teacher's face was now a shade between blue and purple. His hand still clutched at his neck. He looked at Patrick, his eyes wide and pleading. Patrick stood and stepped forward. 
His body moved without his consent. He felt pulled towards the teacher. He grabbed the teacher around the waist, formed a fist, and pushed inward as hard as he could. The teacher's body flapped like a rag doll in his arms. This should work, he thought to himself as he did the motion again. Still nothing. Again. The fourth time, a pretzel was expelled and shattered on the table. The teacher gasped for air. Patrick let go and stepped to the side, his arms hanging loosely. A lump formed in his throat. Dude, you're a hero, a shaggy-haired classmate said. Patrick nodded and smiled as a little crowd formed around him, giving him high fives and hugs. The teacher turned to him and smiled as he placed a hand on Patrick's shoulder. Thank you. He did feel like a hero. Without him, there's no telling what could have happened to this teacher. That pretzel had nearly ended his life, and Patrick had rescued him. As he thought about this, his back straightened, his shoulders broadened, and he became more confident. While he wore a smile, his face also began to blush. He did handle this situation well, but that didn't make him special. Anyone would have tried to save the teacher. He shuffled his feet as he rubbed his shaking hands along his jeans. We're going to move ahead just a little bit further in the day now. Um, Hi, he said, all of his awkwardness dripping out of him. He smiled at her, his blush blossoming on his face, down his neck, and likely on his chest, but his thin shirt obscured this. He had wanted to talk to her for weeks, and here she was, alone in the hallway after he had saved a man's life. My friend told me what happened in study hall. Mr. Larson is lucky you were there, she said, smiling, her warm smile. Nervousness arose in his chest. To calm himself, he looked at his new shoes, remembered his heroic actions with his teacher, and recognized that if he did not ask Shilpa to prom now, he would never do so. Oddly, asking evoked more fear than his teacher struggling for breath. Patrick exhaled as he thought, be cool, things are only awkward if I make it awkward. So are you thinking about going to prom, he said. Her smile thinned and her eyes sparkled. Definitely, but I don't have a date yet. What about you? Patrick's heart sprang into his throat. I'm, I'm going to. I bought my ticket early, but uh, yeah, yeah, same thing. His face flushed, his palms sweated. I just saved someone's life. Why is this harder, he thought. <laughs> she smiled at him. What about us going together? I know we don't know each other, but we could hang out before then, you know, to decrease the awkwardness. Relief. Patrick nodded. Yeah, that, that sounds cool. It would be good for pictures, and we should get to know each other better. I feel bad we haven't talked even with our lockers so close. You seem pretty cool. She smiled and spoke. I can pick you up if that's cool. I don't want to take a limo. I drive a black SUV, and her cheeks darkened slightly as she looked down at the floor. Sorry, it's just embarrassing. I love reindeer, like, a lot. So I keep the reindeer antlers people get for their cars for Christmas time on year-round. I know it's weird. It was weird. It was also endearing. He smiled. Cool, let's exchange numbers, and I'll text you my address. Then I'll, I'll see you then. Well, I'll see you tomorrow at the locker. But yeah, you know what I mean. Um, his own blush returned, a telltale pink, as he took his phone back from her and said goodbye. As he walked to the bus, he was sure this would be the happiest day of his life. First, he had saved someone's life, and then he had the courage to ask Shilpa to the prom. Technically, she had asked him, but he was about to before she interrupted him. Uh, maybe he wasn't as much of a coward as he feared. Maybe he could accomplish all of the things he dreamed of. It was strange to him how he was calmer when saving his teacher than when asking a girl to prom. Talking to Shilpa, his heart raced, and he felt speechless. Don't think too much about it. It's a great day. Just enjoy it, he, he thought to himself. As he settled into his seat on the bus, it started down the road. He looked out the window, and to the left, a canary blue minivan sped down the road. The bus stopped at the intersection, and then the light changed. The van did not slow. Patrick heard the bus driver mutter, he better slow down. A black SUV with reindeer antlers on the roof turned left and entered the intersection. The blue van honked and swerved, hitting the SUV in the rear. The sounds of the accident were loud, the thunk of the impact, the screeching tires. The van struck another car and stopped. The SUV flipped, rolling completely around before striking the guardrail. It teetered and then tipped over the guardrail and disappeared down the embankment. Shilpa! Patrick rushed off the bus and sprinted towards the hill. 
As he arrived at the bent guardrail, pushed low to the ground, he peered down the hill as the SUV continued to roll. A crowd joined him. All eyes were riveted on the rolling, crushed SUV. Wow, that does not look good, someone said. Another person screamed that someone needed to call 911. Several voices began phone calls, all harried, all told about the disaster. Some of the adult men devised a plan to traverse the embankment, to help the victim, to help Shilpa. Wordlessly, Patrick stepped over the guardrail and began moving down the hill. He needed to make sure she was okay. As he moved downward, the images of a path of destruction passed by. Small trees snapped, indentations in the earth, displaced rocks strewn about. Solely focused on getting to the SUV, he paid little attention to these details. He found the reindeer antlers on the hill, picked them up, and kept moving. She wanted to have these, he said aloud to no one. He clung to them as he clung to his hope that she was okay. The hill was steep, but he traversed it without any falls or slips. The SUV lay on its wheels next to a large tree which had finally stopped the terrible descent. All sides of the vehicle pushed inward, creating a misshapen box that reminded Patrick of his broken refrigerator. Fear bubbled inside of him, and involuntarily, he made a noise. Pushing his feelings down, he moved towards the front of the SUV. The windshield was shattered, most of the glass inside the car. Shilpa's body slumped back against the sheet. She was so far away. Patrick blinked, and she was much closer, her dark hair in front of her face. She looked battered and unconscious. He jumped backward when her hand moved upward, waving to him. She collapsed onto the steering wheel, her hand pushed against the still inflated side airbag, leaving a handprint of soft red, except for the bolder imprint of her ring finger. He was at the caved-in driver's door. His heart raced. He bent down and tugged on the door handle. It did not budge. He closed his eyes, an anger rising inside of him. He planted his feet and pulled as hard as he could on the handle. He stared into the car, the opaque airbag, all that he could see. His arms shook as he strained, his back arching, pulling harder. He had to rescue her. The door crunched. He opened his eyes as the door moved slightly. Putting his left hand on the hood of the car, he pulled harder. The cracking intensified. Finally, the door separated from the vehicle. The metal ripped free, sounded like the car screaming. Patrick stumbled and fell as the door slid over his head, scraped his face, and buried itself into the dirt. He reached up and touched his right cheek, feeling a small, tender cut. The impossibility of what was happening barely registered. Shilpa's unresponsive body was his sole concern. He reached into the car, unbuckling her seatbelt, and spoke to her. Don't worry, I'm here. I can take care of you. His voice cracked. Airbags hung from the steering wheel on the passenger side like limp stuffed sheets. He brushed her hair back, revealing a shard of glass buried above her eyebrow and a stream of blood down her face. He held her face to his chest as he breathed deeply, wrapping his arms around her. It's okay, he whispered into her ear, trying to be brave, when all he could feel was an untamable terror. Sirens in the distance, not close, but audible. He closed his eyes and pictured the intersection, the school just beyond, the flags flying at half-mast, the sign advertising prom. He knew he needed to get there. Panic rose in his throat, and he lowered his head to calm down. The next noise he heard sounded like air being inhaled into a pair of iron lungs, a rushing, metallic sound. His mouth tasted like metal as well. He opened his eyes, still holding Shilpa, but now they were in the middle of the road, somehow. The crowd peered over the bankment, murmuring was amongst them, What the hell? He gasped and yelled, I'm over here. She's over here. Can someone help us? We need help. The crowd turned their eyes wide as they rushed over. She's really hurt, Patrick said, as he, sh as he laid Shilpa on the ground in front of him. And we'll stop there. Thank you so much, everybody, and please join us for refreshments and conversation. Thank you.